Um, so this morning we have the privilege of uh, welcoming uh, Wendy and John Buchanan from GC3 uh, to come and uh, share with us. So um, Wendy and John, um, they are the new mission ambassadors of GC3 who have started to remain. And they're kind enough to reach out to us. So we thought we'd ask them to come and tell us uh, on, on Sunday, tell us a bit more about themselves, about GC3, what they do, uh, and also to uh, uh, give us a presentation on, uh, an abbreviated presentation of what they spoke on uh, at the CCA, the summit, which is the Upside Down Kingdom. Uh, now, I initially said I wouldn't introduce them too much, but actually, they did send me a very good bio, so I thought I'd just read that out uh, just so that we can get to know them a little bit better. So, um, Winnie and John are both born, and they mostly grew up in Christchurch. So, they att attended Philmorton High and Canterbury University, so they are from around this area. Um, so, after graduation, they moved up to Alton, and John worked for uh, Price Waterhouse in 1983. They moved to Hamilton, uh, and John lectured at the university and also pastored at Chapel Hill Community Church for about nine years. Uh, during this time, when he cared for their growing family and retrained as an ESOL teacher and, and teacher trainer once the children were all at school. So they have three children, all married, and they have five grandchildren. Uh, and from 2013 and through 20. 2023, they taught in the Bible College in their district in Texas. So, uh, without further ado, I'll welcome Dr. Wendy and John. Thank you. Good morning. Morning, Baba. Yeah, we'll, we'll teach you one word of Burmese. <laughs> When you say hello to people, it's three parts. Ming ga ba fu la ba. Ming ga la ba. Ming ga la ba. And it means everything auspicious, everything good to you. Oh. <laughs> you, you probably won't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've can you hear me? Yep. If I go exactly. a bit closer? Yeah, correct. Right. Okay. All right. John and Wendy, Mission Ambassadors. Okay, so James has already done a really good introduction. <laughs> so <coughs> we were asked to explain that what GC3 is. Well, there's a whole group of Open Brethren Churches in New Zealand. And we have a very flat organisation. Nobody is above us. Every, every church is independent. However, there are two groups who serve the Brethren Churches. They are Triple C and Z and GC3. Um, Triple C and Z supports the churches in what they do in New Zealand. So at the summit last week, there were uh, workshops on Christian camping, governance for churches, prayer, children's ministries, and um, other things as well. And we were invited as the sister um, organization to talk about mission. So Triple C NZ also is interested in mission, but local mission. So the things that you're doing in your in your community, people you may support in your community. Thank you. Uh, GC3 stands for Global Connections, and there are three parts to GC3. Uh, <clears throat> there is mission, which is to do with cross-cultural mission, whether in New Zealand or overseas, and that's the part that we are um, linked to. Assist is the part of the organisation which receives um, monies from people. So if you have a missionary overseas, um, the money may be sent through GC3 and GC Assist will make sure that it goes to the person or people in the way that you have asked. And, yeah, and aid is different from mission in that it is not targeted at Christians. So there was flooding in Brazil recently and 
a partner there asked for funds to help with the flooding. Um, similarly with the war in Ukraine. So when people give to those um, projects, the, the donations will be given to everybody in need, not just Christians. And that, those gifts are tax deductible, so GC Assists also manages that, makes sure that, that those monies are used appropriately. So what I'm now looking at um, the Global Connections and Mission part of it. What we work with the churches and with the mission partners. So we can provide churches with guidance and practical support. For example, if somebody in your community wants to go into cross-cultural mission, either here or overseas, we can help you with the commendation process for that how you decide that you're going to support that person or people. Um, as I said, GC Assist will provide a secure platform for receiving donations and make sure that the mission partners can stay in good books with the IRD in New Zealand. Um, we visit churches like this or come in talking with elders and missions committees to enhance awareness, engagement, and mission. So going out into our communities. And we produce um, information and publications, which we will have available later. So that's what we do with churches. Oops, it has to come up. Oops, gone too far. Yes. Partnering with the missionaries. So when we were on the field in our restricted access country, which we can now tell you is Myanmar because we're no longer based in a restricted access country, um, they sent us the gifts from our supporters every month. Uh, they provided us with advice and support. So how do we get insurance? Things like that. What do we do when we... Um, need to contact other churches. They kept in touch with us. They, um, we network with other missionary organizations like Missions Interlink. So we're not all just spending lots of money doing the same things. Um, we, for example, if somebody needs uh, debriefing, where can they go for debriefing? Like you've been over, you're preparing to go overseas or you've been overseas, who can you talk to about the issues that you're facing? Um, we did this before we went to Myanmar and again afterwards, so we didn't take any extra baggage with us and when we came back to work through any issues that had arisen while we were, were away. And a big part of what GC3 does is prayer support. We have a daily prayer guide, and all our mission partners are listed in that. Uh, and we also have something called eConnect, which is a weekly email, comes into your inbox, and it's the <coughs> most recent prayer requests for people who are on the mission field. So for those of you that like numbers, this is what GC3 is doing. 206 people are serving in 39 countries with 71 sending churches within the Brethren movement. What are those people doing? Well, they're doing lots of different things, as you can see up there. Outreach, teaching the Bible, <coughs> relief. It, you can read that quite easily. And four people at the bottom there are resettling. And that's, uh, especially if you've lived overseas for 10, 15 years, coming back, your culture's changed. It's quite hard. And uh, anyway, so that's what all the people are up to. Okay? Yeah. Let's skip one. Yeah. 
So the daily prayer guide, as I mentioned before, um, has information about the prayer partners, their first names, if they're in a restricted access country, if they're in somewhere where we can know about it, there's their family name and their, a picture of them, and who sends them, what they're doing. It's divided into 31 days, so you can pray for a number of um, missionaries each day. However, we subscribed to eConnect, and we mostly use the, the recent prayer requests, and then we look them up in the book and say, oh, that person's in Bolivia. Um, and that gives, look it up on the map or whatever. Uh, so that's how we do it, but it's up to you how you use the material. So we encourage you to pick up a prayer guide after the service and subscribe to eConnect. So you can, it's really encouraging because you, it's really encouraging because you um, you see God at work in, in all over the world. It just raises your eyes. Uh, one thing that GC3 does is Headspace. Now I see some young adults here. Headspace is a gap year program for young people who are just finishing school. It's for 18 to 25 year olds. It's, it took a pause from COVID times and this year it's starting again. And instead of being based in Auckland or yeah, up in North Island, this, from now on it's going to be based in Christchurch. So um, people study, they earn money for an overseas mission trip <coughs> and they come back and debrief and they're thinking about where they, what they're going to give their lives to. So this is a really good place to start thinking. Okay. This is our understanding of mission, that we are all called to mission. Here where we live, or there where we might go. So there's a sense in which in God's design, that we're pretty sure that we're all missionaries one way or another. And just a little uh, note from the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the Great Commission, where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Literally, it means as you go. So you don't have to go somewhere to do mission but as you live your life, as you work in your workplace, as you meet your neighbours, we make disciples, we share the good news of Christ. So I think mission is for us all, not just for a few people who go overseas and work in a different country. So we talk, I want to talk a little bit about the big topics, the upside down kingdom, and what is a missionary? Or is this, oh, yeah. oh, this is Wendy again. <laughs> <laughs> the three questions we have here. That, uh, sorry. Oh. I don't know. Not sure. Yeah. Well, no. So, before we got to this one. Uh, our focus with GC3 is cross-cultural mission um, here and overseas. But having been in contact with your elders, um, we understand that you are considering where your focus should be. In, and we hope that what we discuss this morning will be helpful to you as you think about these things. So when moving away now from talking about GC3, to talking about mission. And we've got two big ideas. Um, one is what, a, what is a missionary? And what does a missionary look like? So here's some questions we'd like you to think about for a couple of minutes. Is a Christian, is a missionary someone who goes somewhere else and gives the good news of Jesus Christ? 
Is it someone who goes somewhere else to make disciples? Is it someone who does those without going somewhere else? So turn to your, the person next to you and share what you think is the missionary. Take a couple of minutes and we're not going to ask you what you said. <laughs> And if you're sitting all alone, find somebody else who's alone and talk with them. What are we doing? Yeah. Yeah, this, this mission is just every opportunity we can see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I told you about our answers. I don't want to do that. I don't think you can think of it. Okay, a couple of Bible verses which will help us in our thinking. This one is from Luke chapter 1, verses 49 to 53, and I'll actually read it this way. (laughs) For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered the proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. This is upside down from what our world is like. In our world, the proud reign, don't they? They are the ones who have the food and the money. But in God's kingdom, he has scattered the proud. He brought down the rulers. He sent the rich away empty because he lifted up the humble and he's filled the hungry with good things. Now, it might still look the other way when you look at at any individual person, but inside, what has actually happened inside us, we know that it's different. The other one is from Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve, and to give his life for many. That, again, it's upside down. This pa- in this passage, Jesus challenges the conventional power structures by emphasizing the virtues of humility and servant leadership. We want to explore how the implications of the upside down kingdom should shape mission and how this can and should be done. But as we've said earlier, it's not just about for those of us who go overseas to another culture. We think about this, where we are right now. There are many cultures here in New Zealand, and we'll look more at that soon. What's a servant leader? Should we, like Jesus, wash the feet of other people? No, probably not. We might do it at Easter. That's not something that we do every day. We live in a different culture. Um, But we should humble ourselves and take on tasks that others wouldn't expect us to do. How about Jesus upturning the tables in the temple? Should we use whips like him and drive the money changers away? Or whatever today's equivalent is? Probably not. 
but we should stand against the things that are wrong. Um, <clears throat> there is more, more than one uh, image or picture of leadership in the Bible. We are choosing to focus today on servant leadership. I think the Jesus with the money changes in the temple is a different um, image of leadership. Um, but today, and it's fair, but today I want to think about um, servant leadership. You say, what about leaders? We're ordinary people in a church. I, but I, we use the word leadership deliberately because you are wanting to bring about change. So you are leading the change, each one of you, in the things that you do. So, summary of three points. The missionary is a servant, not a boss. You're working to serve others, not yourself. Missionary is a guest, especially if you go across cultures. And the missionary earns the respect of the people that he or she serves. It takes time. For example, when we lived in Myanmar, we think it took about two and a half years to be respected, to belong, to be accepted in a genuine way. It takes time. So it's not a quick thing that uh, just happens. Here's a picture uh, that adds a little bit more detail to the description of a servant leader. So you'll remember the story where Peter has actually denied Jesus three times and Jesus has died, risen, and now they're on the shore of Lake Galilee having breakfast and Jesus takes Peter aside and asks him a question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? It's not a common question. Do you ask people that question very much? Do you say to people, do you love me? We don't do it. This is a vulnerable question. This is an invitation to be rejected. You know, do you love me? Oh, no, not really. <laughs> oh. So, here is Jesus as a leader being vulnerable. Another example is from John chapter 6 where there's the bread of life discourse and Jesus says some things like, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you cannot be part of me. And a whole lot of people say, this is too difficult, and they just go. They start leaving him. So he turns to his disciples. What does he say to them? You know, let, just hold on, guys. This is a blip. We'll get through it. No. He says, do you want to leave too? That is vulnerable. And in our culture, and even more so in Myanmar, Myanmar culture, that's not a good look. We don't like to be vulnerable. But if we want to follow Jesus' example as a servant leader, vulnerability is one aspect of it that, especially in mission, we should be mindful of. So, yeah. Okay. Culture. If you go cross-cultural, culture is an issue. And so here's a little picture of an iceberg about 15 to 20% of the iceberg is above the water. That's all you can see. 80, 85% of it is under the water. If you look down close in the water, you can see a bit of it, but that's big stuff at the bottom you can't see at all. Cultures like that. It's deep within us the way we do things and we don't are usually not even aware of what we are doing or why we're doing. It's just it's just what you do. 
In Myanmar, people had cultural practices that we thought were weird. They didn't even think about it. They just, that's what you do. And, and so when we interact with people of a different culture, it just takes a lot of time to understand that and uh, go down. All right, keep going. So, culture. And when it comes to mission, there are three cultures that are relevant in cross-cultural mission. The Christian culture, my culture, and their culture. Okay? I, I may not be of the same culture as the people that I am reaching. So what's really important there is the Christian culture. My culture isn't very relevant when I'm going to people of another culture. And their culture is kind of important, and some of it needs to change. <laughs> so that's the minus, the cross, and the plus. So it's a bit of a mix of what we bring there. And in Myanmar, if you go anywhere cross-culturally, yeah, people do things. You want to talk about Arnold? Mm. Yeah, that'd be good. When we were planning to move to Myanmar, we needed a visa. And the principal of the college had promised to get us the kind of visa that would enable us to live in a community, <coughs> not in a hotel. And I went to visit him about four months before we were due to move there. <clears throat> Had a wonderful meal with his family, great visit. Um, but every time I tried to bring up the topic of the visa, the conversation just went ever so smoothly in a different direction. <laughs> and I got back to the hotel and I thought, huh, what's happening there? I just couldn't understand it. Surely he understands that it takes time to get a visa and we're running out of time. So I rang another Kiwi friend in Yangon and said, this just happened. What does it mean? And he said, ah, that's Ana Day, which is like embarrassment or shame. And he said, you're supposed to know by the fact that he won't talk about it, it's deliberate, it wasn't an accident, um, that he can't do it. But because it's shameful for him not to do what he's promised. He can't tell you. Okay. So I said, so, okay, he can't do it. What do we do now? And we figured out, came up with another plan, um, which really did work. And we met this another two or three times. Um, it's, it can be used for good. It can be used for not so good. Like, I will borrow some money from you which I don't intend to repay, but I can get away with it because I know you can't ask me for it. Mm. Um, so the, the aspect of culture, is it Christian culture? It could be, but maybe not at some aspects of it. Depends how it's used. Yeah. Thanks. Here's a, <clears throat> I was reading a book a while ago about Western missionaries by an Ethiopian Christian. He said, missionaries saw themselves as helping lower civilizations rise to become more civilized like them. The missionary calling was confused by the civilizing effort of Western nations. Jesus' mission was to make people like Jesus. Civilizing men to make people like us. Right? There's a big difference there. And so the, the missionaries to Myanmar, many countries, they shared their knowledge, material blessings, the gospel message, but often they didn't share their own lives and homes with the people that they served. And so this is what uh, Maimo said. You've given your goods to feed the poor. You've given your bodies to be burned. We also ask for love. Give us friends. 
really challenging words. This is from James. Yeah. So we asked James um, about Rowley community and what is the, we use the word ethnic, um, structure um, is probably different from when we lived here um, nearly 40 years ago. So this is what he sent us. Um, this is Hill Morton, not just Raleigh. So 70% are European and the other 30% is made up of Maori, Pacifica, Asian and others. And as we sit in church today, we see something similar, and this is what James said, that your church is the makeup of your church. Roughly a third Asian, a third Pacifica, and a third New Zealand European. So that's really interesting in terms of reaching your community here. And, and getting to know each other <laughs> in, in different cultures, I think it's a great blessing. Really, really is. So, you already have different cultures, and by God's grace, you're getting on together, and that's a great start. Um, one thing this means is that if you are trying to um, reach some Asian people in the streets around here, you have people who know how you should approach them, what sorts of things are good to do. Um, that you take your shoes off when you go in the door. <laughs> um, how many times do you need to be invited to eat before you eat? And what you should take with you when you go there? All those little things that make a difference. Um, yeah. So this is some reflections from our living on, in Myanmar. We've already spoken about um, some of it. In Myanmar, many churches sing hymns, but hymns are not part of Myanmar culture. Neither the Ma, the majority ethnic group, nor the um, smaller ethnic groups. Um, I thought, why do they sing hymns? In the last 10 years, we've seen that they have started to not just translate hymns into their languages, but also to write their own songs and increasingly Christian Christian, their own Christian songs, and increasingly we're hearing the, the sounds of their music, the cadences, the way they sing. Um, they all sit, uh, they, don't, they already have changed from chairs, they don't sit on chairs, they sit on, on the floor. They generally sit with women on one side and men on another, not so much in the big cities, Life is different in the cities, it's more western, but they're, they're, sometimes they are incorporating their own culture into the way they worship, and other times not so much. I've already spoken about Arna Day, and John has said that it took about two and a half years for us to be heard, not just for us to be heard, but for us to hear them. You, you, we're just not aware how much of the way we are is because of the country that we've grown up in, or even the social group in our country that we have grown up in. So after two and a half years, we realized that some of the ideas that we had to bring to them just weren't going to work there. Um, was that peer performance reviews will not work. They are needed, but the way we do them in New Zealand just won't work there. So we have to find some other way of helping develop people. And um, the last one is uh, from one of our students who, he's, got, he's training to be a pastor, and he said, I want to be a servant leader. But he understands what the Bible is saying about this. But I can't get anything done unless I'm a dictator leader. So, He's trying hard to practice what he thinks, but it's difficult in that situation. So 
coming to the end now. We had two main ideas, um, and that's a focus on who is a missionary and what a missionary should look like. So here, we are all called to mission. Here where we are right now, and there where we may go. If you think about the Great Commission, it starts in Jerusalem, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But when they went out to the ends of the earth, that didn't stop in Jerusalem. It kept going in Jerusalem. So, um, the thinking is that we are all on mission with God, and it's here. We send people, maybe into our community, all of us go into our community, also overseas. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's both and. And the last bit there, we go as servants. White people have this idea that they've got it all sussed and we're bringing all this good stuff. Well, we take some good stuff, but actually we go as servants, not as people just giving it. So, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. From what little we know of what your church is doing, we're encouraged. And uh, the extent to which we can offer any useful advice or assistance, uh, we're glad to hear from you. And uh, other than that, we, we just pray that uh, you'll be a blessing to the people around you, who you work with, who you uh, live with, and that uh, they will see Christ in you and be drawn to him and believe. Yeah. So thank you. God bless you.